Okay, hey, praise the Lord, everybody. Hey, this is Apostle Cedric, um, and welcome to the Supernatural 101 um, podcast. Um, I need some shea butter out of that um, bag. Um, I'm a little ashy, so I'm gonna lotion up real quick. Um, but I'm super excited. Um, we are doing a series called Claytosis, which actually means to be called or invited to um, proclaim the goodness of Jesus. And so I wanted to talk to some young people um, and just talk to some people that I know who are out here preaching the word of God. And, you know, um, God has kind of forced them to be examples in the kingdom. And um, I just want to talk to some, and I get to talk to my nephew, the prophet Dion. Um, you know, I'm sure y'all follow him on social media and on TV and all those things. Um, he's more famous than I. And so um, we, we're so excited that he's here. Um, you know, he's a bit of a fashionista and, and a prophet. So that it may be something about that prophetic garment. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we're super excited to have him in here. Hey, hey, nephew, Prophet Dion, how are you? Hi, I'm well. How are you? You know, I'm super fantastic on top of the world and still rising. Um, How's your day been? Everything been well? My day has been great. It's, it started very, very early this morning. I was able to take me a little nap, and now I'm up working again. Amen. Good, good. So if you could just introduce yourself a bit uh, for some people. You know, I talk about the stuff that I love about you. Um, but, you know, who is Prophet Dion, if you can tell me, like, in a quick little synopsis? Um, Prophet Dion, well, I'm he. <laughs> Your pronouns. <laughs> um, I am he. Um, Prophet Dion is just a, a regular guy just out here trying to impact the world. Um, you know, just called by God at very young. I submitted my life to the Lord at very young, been in ministry over, I guess, this year will make 19 years I've been in ministry. Well, been preaching since yeah, about 19 years. Um, been in prophetic ministry for a very, very long time. Um, I've just I've done a I've I don't feel like I've done a lot, but some people think I've done a lot. I still think I'm still scratching the surface of what I'm believe the Lord has called me to do. And but um I've been out here a little a little minute giving God over half of my life. And um Prophet Dion is very much a laid back, reserved type of person that just just love the Lord. I guess for the most part, if that's if we're talking in third person, <laughs> I like it. it. Makes you deep when you're talking third person. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. So what well, you said early age. So how were you when you got saved? I was four when I actually got saved. Oh, you beat me. I was six. That's fun. Do you remember? I remember. Um, so I got saved. I was probably singing. I was singing a solo at Newborn Church of Faith in Christ, His Eyes on the Sparrow. And um, after um, I sung, because, you know, when you're a kid, they just boost you up anyway. So they just went into a whole convulsion, like I really did something. And um, after that, they went into that whole praise God moment. Um, Pastor Juanita Edwards, she called the altar call, and I told my mama I wanted to get saved. I got saved. Oh, that's hot. Um, how old were you when you first preached? I was 11. Okay, I beat you. I was eight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How old were you when you first got... Now, were you licensed back then? Like, well, when you were early on? So, in that particular... No, I was 12. Let me stop. I was 12 when I first preached. So, that particular church, uh, they did what was called, like, watch night service. I remember those. And so, on watch night service, all oh, all the little people that was aspiring to be something, they got up and did um, what we call words of exaltation. Mm -hmm. And so after that, they would uh, give you like a little paper that says you was like a junior minister in training. And then you 
you went for a year, and then next year you became a junior minister, and then <clears throat> you became a, a junior prophet in training, and then the next year you became a prophet in a prophet, junior prophet, then the next year you became a prophet, and you know, keep going on and on. Right. So, um, I gave. So you my, started like. So you started like twelve. Yeah. So I got my junior minister in training license at twelve. <laughs> That's funny. That's fun. Was y'all PAW? I don't know what they was. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, because they had like junior bishops, junior deacons, junior pastors, like almost every like ordination or whatever they had. It was, like junior... it was a church. I, I'm not sure what. Um, I guess we were like fellowship prayer band. That's what it was called because he that particular church was a breakout was a breakout one of the breakout churches from up under a mother's a stellar boy at that time and so the whole fellowship was called fellowship prayer band so i guess it's kind of the way they did it but mother boy was originally kojic years ago right and then she kind of her own thing just kind of burst out now i think I, so they put her out because you know back then they didn't believe in like women preachers in that area but, but they didn't just make her no supervisor? Nah, she wasn't no supervisor, baby. <laughs> <laughs> they put her out and she just thought she was doing her own thing. So But did she have like a little church somewhere in um Ohio? Um Mother Dupree has a church in Ohio. But yeah, I know she does. But I thought they said uh Mother Boy had a church in somewhere like Mainsville, Ohio, or something like that. I don't know for sure. I think I, revivals up there, I think. But I know Mother Dupree, they helped birth Mother Dupree's church because it was like a prayer tower or what we call modern day hub. They mm -hmm. called prayer towers back then. And so um it turned into a church. Yeah, I like the prayer towers. Do what did they used to do in them prayer? Do you know? Um, from what I remember, just pray, lay hands, teach, you know, sanctification, you know, stuff like that. But mostly just, you know, pray. Mm -hmm. Were you old enough to meet get to meet Mother Boy? I was. Mother Boy was the first person to tell me I was a prophet at seven years old. Oh wow. I never got to meet her. I just see, I remember uh, I got to meet Stax, but I never got to meet Mother Boy. And she used to say, Black Prophet. <laughs> hey, Black Prophet. And I used to say, hey. And I used to be so nervous. I was like, don't let her say nothing. I don't want her to reach her hand towards me and say inflammation or nothing. But, uh... <laughs> but um, yeah, I met Mother Boy. I met Mother Boy when I was probably... Well, let me backtrack right? because my mama met Mother Boyd in 1989 at Bishop Ronald Brown, the late Bishop Ronald Brown's church. And she started following the prayer band ministry. And then Mother Boy uh, met Pastor Christopher Mike, who was my childhood pastor. He, um, she, she said that God sent him as a prophet and um, to the fellowship prayer band. And um, he birthed the church in Savannah called Resurrection Ministries of Christ. That was in 1996. And my mama was the minister of music okay. for that church. And um, my mother was a daughter of Zion. And, you know, throughout the years, I grew up. So that's all I knew. I was born in. So a lot of people, they came in through you know, Mother Stacks and Mother Rush and a lot of those, but right. I'm one of the ones that was actually born in the fellowship from the original. Right. So Mother right. Stacks watched me grow up as a kid. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. But that's good. You gave, gave good little, uh, a good foundation. Um, and so you got your singing ministry and stuff from your mom. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's hot. Okay. Did you see The Little Mermaid? I did not. I seen the like the white version. <laughs> uh, or the cartoon version. Excuse me, just going gonna be no, live. that's no, that's gonna be all right. Um I uh remember the little fish? Um, what was his name? Flounder. Flounder on the new one is horrible. Don't look at it. It's he got um Kim Kardashian lips. It's so scary and demonic. Like you do not want to. I've been telling, don't go see it, because them lips will give you a horrible, uh, 
<laughs> nightmares because they're so ugly. It's so scary. Like it was not, I didn't work with them lips. But do you know the little song that they've been singing? Uh, wish I could be. Um, a part of your world or something yeah do you know that little part that they've been doing no i wasn't really into the little mermaid like when i was younger <laughs> ain't the five Most boys was anyway though mama but... i couldn't watch disney channel i couldn't watch mtv disney channel uh mtv vh1 all of that was demonic so i a lot of the things i learned from like school secondhand and Jen, little mermaid wasn't really on my radar like that so i don't so when that we I was probably never even seen it all the way through probably oh so you holiness holiness yeah <laughs> so what was you singing at that age <laughs> i would trust in the lord there's a plan from the lord to redeem <laughs> oh lord do something for me <laughs> that's so funny but you know i didn't hear my first time listening to secular music i was like 13. um yeah i probably was in middle school once i started staying with my cousins and we started going to the same schools and my cousin would pick me up from school and i probably would that's probably where i was introduced to it but before that, yeah because i'm the first song secular song i ever heard was uh week by swv and I thought that was amazing. I was like, now nah, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I can't believe that I was raised like that. And it was like, like it was a, a little mind shocker that people wasn't safe. Like I thought everybody was safe. I thought everybody went to church all day. I thought mm -hmm. everybody did like all that stuff. Like I thought everybody, you know, figured out how nigga grow up, what they were gonna do in the church. And when I found out people was like sleeping in on Sundays and stuff, I was like, what in the world? I've been missing out. Too. I used to go to school and hit people in the chest like mother boy and I got <laughs> suspended. Did you? Yeah. I and did too. Then my mom ex explained to them where I got it from. And so they was like, well, we understand, but you can't do that. You can tell him you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> what grade was you in? I was in pre-K when I was on that. <laughs> That's funny. And when I was in high school, I told all my friends that if we're gonna be remain friends, we they gotta be filled with the Holy Ghost. So I took them all in one hallway and I prayed for them. I laid hands on them until almost everybody got filled with the Holy Ghost. And so when the teachers and security were like trying to come in the hallway, I was blocking them. I was like, mm, the Lord is working. And I got suspended for that. <laughs> and then when I was in elementary school, I got suspended because I used to have a five minute Bible study before recess started, because I said, we have to tithe our time um, to the Lord. And so they were like, you can't make the kids. I was like, they want to do it. And a lot of kids still did want to do it after they suspended me. But yeah, I got suspended when I was in third grade for that. And then when I was in high school for getting all my friends filled with the Holy Ghost. Hobasha. Oh, and it was crazy because our assistant principal, though, he was his wife was like really like into church and stuff, but he was re rebellious and demonic. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. Okay, since you grew up in church like that, like so, you like like I tell people this, like when I first like my first time ever like going to a, a bar or a club all that kind of stuff. I was a licensed minister. I mean, I got licensed when I was 14 and I never got to, I never left the church. I've never did anything out of the church. The church actually introduced me to everything that they call sin. Um, like it introduced me like from the church. How was your experience growing up as a minister? Cause you were 12. Like, how did you, how did you grow up and still kind of be normal? So to say, and know that you have this call in your life. How was that? I don't think I really had a normal life. Mm -hmm. uh, what most people view as normal. My mama was the minister of music, the daughter of Zion, the administrator. And then plus my mama was also a teacher in the public school system. And so my life never really was normal. I always it was always I had to share you know her or and I it wasn't like I was without her but like um 
well, I think with Shirley Caesar, I, I, so somebody, I went with her everywhere. So, you know, whether it was church or school, I was there. So, um, and we spent a lot of our time between those two entities. And so um, growing up in church, it, you found friends in church. Me and the pastor's kids were best friends because my mom was the minister of music and his, his da daddy was the, you know, the pastor. And so we ran the church kids. And so we used to beat everybody up, but that was kind of, that's <laughs> you just found friends in church and you kind of just learn how to um, make church a part of your, your life or, or church was your life. For me, it was, it, that's what it was. You know, that was fun for me. I was going to church because at home I was the only child. And so I was going to church to hang out with the church kids. Um, but I would say, you know, as I got older um, and, you know, being exposed to different things. So as you get older, high school, different things, I, it, I did start to build a resentment, not necessarily against, um, well, yeah, it was. I was. It was against my mom and against the church because I always felt like I had missed moments as a kid, you know, where we could have had, you know, just us time or you know whatever um I had to always share her either with the church or either with the children at school and so I resented the church because I didn't I felt like a lot of moments that other kids got in high school or other things they did or other things they could do that I could not do because of what the church said um I was um it caused me to have a resentment. And I remember a long time, I hated Juanita Bonham because <laughs> 2000, 1999, two, no, two, Savannah Seeks Power, 1999. Mm -hmm. I used to play the drums. Many people don't know that, but I was a drummer before I became a preacher. And so 1989, she had a, she was at our church um, <laughs> with Pastor Mike and um, she had a revival. And the revival just kept going on and on. We got the week. We was going to church every day. I mean, every day. And then she, it got, it was in December and it got around Christmas time. And she told them, the people, not to buy their children Christmas gifts. But, and the Lord said, don't buy Christmas gifts. Don't buy no gifts. We need to be in consecration and fasting. And I hated her because all of my neighborhood kids, everybody, um, everybody in school had new clothes, new shoes, new everything. And because my mama was so, you know, church, I didn't get no Christmas that year. And ooh, I hated Juanita, baby. <laughs> I love her now if she wants. Right. <laughs> but I hated Juanita in nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> I resented Juanita Bonham. You couldn't say her name without me hating her. But <laughs> <laughs> so she is screwed. She was, but you know, those are different times. And people really, I would say, those people, whatever they pastor or they prophet or their minister told them, they took it as gold. Mm -hmm. Like today, you know, we get a lot of challenges you know different things because we have it's a different day it's a different group of people a different mindset there's so many different outlets to look things up and search things for yourself you know but back then you know whatever our prophet said whatever our prophet, they took it as gold yeah so she felt like she was going against god if she would have bought me a gift when in actuality she wouldn't have but I forgive you, Juanita Bonham. You know, I, like that. <laughs> I was gonna say that's good, but okay. So, like with that, now, so now that you're kind of in that place now, you know, as the preacher, um, as a prophet of God, um, conference host, and um, I ain't gonna touch the apostolic. I see you have, but <clears throat> how do you? I mean, how do you, like, do you feel like that kind of benefited you in terms of, like, your level of obedience to your call? 
Because I think what's weird is that I think that there's a generation of people who, and there's a lot of the newer people that when they didn't grow up in it, to me, it's it, and I, I may be wrong, but to me, it kind of feels like their call is like an option. Um, or if it's something that you can kind of, I don't know, it just seems very optional. Like, you know, you do it when you feel like it, or, you know, when it's well, or, you know, when it's a great opportunity. But um, <clears throat> when God will cause us to do certain things that are uncomfortable, I think those of us who were kind of like born in it, we take that serious and we deal with ourselves enough to submit to whatever God wants us to do, while the others, they will actually contend with God about the instructions. Like, so do you think that has kind of helped posture you to be a more, what do I want to say, now obedient, but a, a more servant type, um, type of uh, person that's called? I don't know if that's a good way to say it, but like, you know, like, does that make it easier for you to kind of hear God and like trust him enough to obey him? Or do you think that it did the opposite for you? So I had a rebellious season. A lot of people don't know. Well, I had a rebellious season. I never really left the church, but I did like stop like, um, like preaching. Like I just, I think I was just doing the bare minimum, just singing at that time. I had a rebellious season and it wasn't until, um, the Lord, um, really struck my body struck my body that I and told me that if I did not do what he called me to do he was gonna kill me and I was literally on my way out of here mm -hmm. and um my yes to God caused me to be renewed um and so for me it's my yes to the Lord I really love what I do and I have fell in love with what I've done. So I'm not on the whole, um, the whole, uh, you know, bandwagon of people that say, you know, if you want to be a prophet, if you want to be a prophet, you know, you know, we got those people that say, that if you want to be a, anybody that want to be, uh, or anybody that, that look that, uh, you know, really enjoy or whatever, they make it seem like being a prophet is so miserable like they just miserable being who they are mm -hmm. like that's dumb i'm not gonna be miserable being nothing who i am if i the lord called me to be um a, i think most the missing think conception is not that i have a problem with being a prophet it's just god's people they will god's people are, are very hard to deal with at times um and so but for me, I love what I do. I fell in love with what I did when God gave me another chance uh, at life. And in order for me to remain alive, I had to submit to my the call on my life. I fell in love with what I what I do. And um, I'm in love with being a prophet. I love to be a prophet. I love when he speaks to me. I love when people receive revelation or people uh, receive the prophetic word and it's accurate and they are able to, you know, come to a solution. I love being what he's called me to be. And so I, I'm, I'm different from a lot of people. I don't see it as a, I see it as a good burden. It can be challenging at times, because it's the people that you that you've called to, like Moses or uh, said, your people. You know, sometimes you'd be like, your people, God. Mm -hmm. But it does not take away my love for, to do what He's called me to do. Yeah, I don't have no um, poems about. Yeah, that. I say that all the time. I always say, like, even when I preach, I, I get to you know when I uh, all the stuff that I do, you know, with Sears House and then with our love churches. Um, I get to do it, you know, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's times you get tired and yes, people are very interesting, but I love people. I love God. Um, and uh, I'm glad you said it because I was telling um, a young prophet a couple of nights ago, I'm like, there are benefits to, you know, being obedient to the Lord and there, and that's fun to me it's fun. Um, and it seems like the more you do it, the kind of better it gets. Um, and you do have your highs and your lows. You do have, you know, the difficult times, but overall you're pleasing God with your life, you know, and with your, uh, calling with your skill set, all those things. And I think it's, 
I think it's dope. I love prophets. I think prophets are to me the absolute best. Um, and one thing that I think is amazing about prophets is that um, a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on um, the Levites and the priesthood, but there was a prophet before there was ever a priest. Um, and the ordination of the prophetic does exist outside of time, um, unlike that of the priesthood. The priesthood was only established because of sin, but the prophet um, was established because there was a God. And so I think um, the the space of a prophet is one of the most um, misunderstood, I think is the most um, desired. Um, you mentioned Moses, and I think it's funny because Moses told them, he said, if it was my way, I wish that everyone could be a prophet. And I think that what he was saying is not that everybody is a prophet. And I think most of these people who say that prophets are not prophets. But I will say, um, I do think that I feel like Moses, I wish they were, because I think prophets have a genuine relationship with God that really is aside from reading a text, that's aside from reading a Bible, that's even aside from you preaching. I think all those things are byproducts of that relationship, you know? And um, I haven't met a legitimate prophet who necessarily wanted to be one, but I don't know a legitimate prophet who doesn't have that type of like core relationship with God. Um, and, you know, just from what you said, just, you know, it all speaks that you have a relationship, you know what I mean? Well, that, most times, if I may interject right here, yeah. on this show podcast, and I know you're very controversial. Um, at well, time, I'm controversial. That's can good. Be That's good. 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 <laughs> I like that about you, you know? <laughs> and I'm 10 toes down with you all, you know? <laughs> I ain't gonna let nobody talk about you. And I, likewise. So I'm controversial in some ways, and I want to be controversial. When you mentioned the part about you've never met a prophet that actually wanted to be one, um, I've always had an issue with that because, well, let me tell you, and this is all facts. When I was younger, I was so enamored by the giftings and the laying of hands and you know the way I grew up and what I saw because that was always in front of me it sparked something in me to want to be like as when I said I went to school and I was hitting people in the chest I wanted to make people fall out like mother boy I didn't know what that was but it ignited something to me to want to do that to want to and so me personally like when people say that if you wanted to, if you want to be, then you necessarily might not be. I personally, mm, I kind of disagree, uh, disagree. I don't believe it's a problem with wanting to be. I believe it's a problem with the with the motive of it. And I just believe that um, I don't think it's I no, nah, I do agree with most people that say I do agree with the fact that most people that claim that they are prophets aren't really prophets. I really agree agree that from a scriptural standpoint. But I do not, I do not like, you know, condemn people that love uh being a prophet or view it as something that is an awesome because it's very it's a very awesome a gift to have is I feel like it's an honor that God chooses you to it is. be that particular gift. And so if the Lord has chose you to be that, why shouldn't you uh love it or fall in love with it or you know embrace it so to speak? Because it's like a lot of times I when people talk on that line, it just sounds like a whole bunch of a whole bunch of bitterness then they start making their own rules like you got to get in 20 car accidents have cancer aids knee problems you know run into plan on traffic they start making these unrealistic rules to be when really it only takes submission to be certainly so like okay so when you said okay so i just i'm gonna so you when you said so as a child because you grew up in it right you said like this was something you aspired to be so same here my grandfather was a bishop when i was a kid i, I said i was gonna be a bishop and i was gonna be a senator those two things i wanted to be as a kid okay catch this um you talked about your rebellious stage i had a little kind of rebellious stage 
Um, but I didn't really know what it entailed to be those things because I, I grew up in it and I seen the price that, you know, that was attractive to me. I seen those things. When I understood the intel of the responsibility of it, there's no way I will want to choose that. But I was excited that God chose it. And so that's when I say you don't want to be it is because if you really understood the weight that it actually takes, the responsibility of lifestyle, the responsibility of, 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 of um, you know, of study, the responsibility of, you know, that your words do matter to people. You know, my words matter to the point if I say, hey, I think you need to pack up your stuff and move to this state that people literally do it like their lives are changed by that. Um, and I think that and so when I say wanting to be um, is is not so much saying that you shouldn't enjoy being it or, you know, you, you know, you didn't think it was cute. But I think that the the weight of the responsibility, I don't think that a person says, hey, I want this responsibility. Um, but I do think that um, and I think that that's because you are aware of what it is. You know, what I mean, it's if you're aware of what it is. Um, uh one of the apostles, um, actually, um, the old folks used to say, and I've read it in one of the texts, but the old folks would talk about how they would rather even be a doorkeeper. Um, uh, and in the Bible, in the synopsis, I believe it says that he said, um, the least in the kingdom is still the greater than, you know, some of those people. So it's because they understood the impact of it. You know what I mean? That the impact was so great. Like you don't grab that lightly, you know. And yeah. one of the things I say about you that I enjoy, um, because now you were born a prophet. Now here's the thing: every prophet isn't born a prophet, um, and that's biblically speaking. You can be a prophet three ways. You can be a prophet. You can be born a prophet. You can be called to be a prophet, like Amos. Amos wasn't a prophet before until God called him to be a prophet. Um, and then you look at like Elisha, um, Elisha wasn't born a prophet. Um, he wasn't in the schools of prophets. He wasn't in the house of prophet. Um, he wasn't in that thing, but then he was commissioned. Another prophet took his mantle and laid it on him and he became a prophet. And so prophets who are born prophets, do you really have any other, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, like, I like, it's like you don't, okay. So yeah. So it's like, you don't have a choice. Correct. But I guess from my vantage point is like, I feel like sometimes with prophetic ministry, I don't know how we got here. I probably just, this is just my mind. But sometimes with prophetic ministry, uh, people who are prophets or who are in a certain level of, um, you know, ranking or authority, so to speak, I believe sometimes we we use like these, these unrealistic set of rules to try to bully people. Um, bully people out of an office um that we don't necessarily think that they are and so that's my that's my thing um and it's like you know we say all these things it's like a scare tactic thing and i'm like why are y'all scared why are y'all scared <laughs> people? like that's true it ain't true. i don't know what you go through but over here, I mean, yeah, we we go through trials and tribulations like the next person, but it ain't that bad. It I, maybe maybe I'm different, but it, it just sounds like a horror story. Like based off of what some people say in the kingdom, it's like, baby, I don't want that. I don't care if I am chosen. You can keep that if that's what all it comes with. Then you can keep it. When realistically, that realistically and biblically, that's not the case. That might have been your avenue in which the Lord took you to be, but that might not necessarily be the case for me. And yeah. so I think sometimes we have to stop making our law of consecration doctrine. Amen. Now, oh. you know, I, no, that I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I mean, and I think about myself and you talk about that, you know, one of the things that um, I'm big on, I love I love a bully. I love a mean person because um, I think God anointed me for them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm ready. I'll be ready to come on. Let's fight because um, that's what happened with me. I mean, I mean, there was a time when people just was like, hey, 
Um, we do not want him to be in this space and the anointing that he has, and this has been said to me, they said that my anointing didn't match like my personality because I'm such a eclectic, I'm such an iconoclast. Um, and, you know, well, you know, my hair was blue for like 10 years. I mean, um, before a lot of these kids start doing all this stuff, I did it, you know, um, I didn't wear suits and I, I'm just not starting to wear a suit because I think I'm getting a little old. So I want to wear a suit every once in a while. But I didn't wear, I refused to wear suits. Um, when I was younger, I used to preach in a do-rag because the man told me once that God can't use me with a do-rag on. Um, and so like I've done things kind of like almost even on purpose to be like, hey, you can't say that about people. When God chooses them, he's aware of who they are when he chose them. And humanity does not offend God. He can handle humans. He made them. And I think that when we start, and you said those scare tactics, we put those things in, but we put those things in to make people deny their humanity. Everybody is different and people are, the expression is going to be different. And, you know, that's what I embrace. I embrace the different expression. Um, you're, you're, I th- I love to hear you prophesy stuff like that, but you don't prophesy like I prophesy. Um, I like to hear you preach, but you don't preach the way I kind of preach, you know, um, there's, and that doesn't mean that you're not it. That don't mean I'm not it. You know what I mean? Because of that. And I think the 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 lack of respect of diversity that everybody has to fit this cookie cutter thing. I think that's what it. it I think it intimidates people who don't have real relationship. And I think it 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 harms the the beauty and the the I don't know the beauty that can be in the office. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you this now. Since you're a prophet now, are you one of the prophets that's called to the nations? Because you know the, all the prophets say they're called to the nations. Are you what does that of, even mean? I personally think that means you go to other nations and you operate as a prophet and God gives you prophetic um, forecasts and instructions for other nations. That's what I personally believe that it means. Um, okay, well, but I've, done it. I've done it. Right. And then some um, say... I don't know. There's some people say they're called to the nation, they ain't been to the nations yet. Um, and I just say, you know, just wait until you get to the nations, or at least get those good nation national invites until <laughs> uh, <laughs> you get there. But okay. Um, but what do you think that God is saying for um us next? Because right now in America is acting crazy and especially politically and stuff like that, what do you think that, what direction do you think that God wants us to go into next? Um, That's a very good question. Honestly, I feel like God is saying what he's always been saying. I just think his voice has gotten a little louder. Um, And I think sometimes Americanized Christians we're kind of late in the reception part because I believe that the prophetic ministry um, definitely it has a grace on it where we talk about the shamaring or the warning of the warning, so to speak. And so I believe that the Lord um, always prepares because the Bible says he does nothing in earth unless he reveals it to his servant, the prophets. And so sometimes based off uh, your level of popularity or based off your level of relevance according to the world standards or the church standards. God could have spoken something 10 years ago, but rather it was heard is the question based off your social status. Um, I said that to say this is like, I believe that the voice of the Lord is definitely getting louder. What he's always been trying to pivot us to is to a kingdom mindset um into us being um coming out of uh, shifting into being definitely the lender and not the borrower um definitely uh causing us to uh shift to a place when we infiltrate uh, more mountains just this the mountain of religion and the mountain of media but we dominate in each mountain prophetically and apostolically um i believe that uh, God is literally preparing an army for a great revival that is getting ready to come. Um, things like COVID and pestilence and different things, those things are going to happen because those things are uh, 
script according to scripture that these things have to happen so some things you cannot help the inevitable but i believe for the kingdom and for the church and for the people of god we can be positioned where we're able to survive during these things so i just really believe that the lord is really trying to cause us to come into a kingdom mindset and really releasing a grace for us to um build and establish our own systems in the earth realm so that we will not have to depend on the system of this world um and um what was the latter part of the question because it's such a huge question and a huge answer like what the lord is speaking he's speaking so he's speaking um it's speaking like a real like a real it's like going from like sentence to like really like uh he's really giving a whole sculpture of what we have now what part of the sentence you have is based off what you've been called to but i believe if everybody comes together with their sentence then we can have a full paragraph of what the lord is saying so from my vantage point um because i'm called to the mountain of media i'm called to the mountain of religion and i'm also called to um a uh, family um uh, from my vantage point, I believe that the Lord is really calling us to come to a place where we begin to uh, infiltrate and invade these systems and begin to reclaim dominion so that we can be a help to everybody in the kingdom. I believe God is really trying to expel this kind of selfish, this selfish spirit, like we over here and we over here, I, I, like denominations and different things. I think the Lord is trying to get us to, to prophetically, cohesively work together so that we can really get prepared for the end time, end time. I like that. Amen. Amen. Amen, Neff. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to ask you one more um so i think um i've i've been doing uh i'm doing two things that are coming up so i got my pr uh prophetic conclave that we've been doing so this is our um fifth one and we're going to actually be back in la where we had our first one we'll be in la this year and this year we're going to talk about the mystery school and we're going to just really just expose some mysteries of god one of the things that i realized um i think that uh we keep hearing that people say that the earth is moaning and groaning, waiting for the appearance of the sons of God or for the sons of God to appear. I And I hear what you're saying. And when to me, what it just reminds me of that the world is really waiting for us. I really believe that the answers to the world is going to come out of the church. I think the world is going to be in a posture where it's going to need the church. Politics is going to need the church where we're going to need the church to help be the um uh you know the old folks called the south to be the ointment that would actually be an anointing to help the the world and especially here in america and i think that's the space that the church is going to actually have to take um and i think god's going to do it through raising up his prophets and i think that the prophets are going to be the ones who are going to re-establish and realign what um the lord believes government is and what leadership is all those kind of things um i'm saying this because um where do you see the next space for the prophetic ministry because i think it's interesting in our generations you know almost every prophet is a preacher i don't think that pro all prophets are preachers um biblically we see that um uh, that you know there were some prophets who only worshiped there were some prophets who um you know only prophesied to persons of authority you know persons of rank um you know they had all different types of prophets and so where do you see the prophetic ministry going like um you know and i heard you talk about those different mountains um but where do you see the prophetic ministry going because i don't see the prophet as being religious um and I think that there are some people who are prophetic voices that are supposed to be in technology, you know, supposed to be in um, finance, who are supposed to be in um, uh, social sciences. Where do you see the prophet in this next season? Um, that's another good question. So I want to say this. I want to just say this. So I am a prophet that preaches, mm -hmm. but I am not. A, I don't, I can preach. That's mm -hmm. my, that's just a talent that I have. I don't even look at it as a gift. I'm very talented at preaching. 
I can preach you out of your socks if I wanted to. Um, but I'm a prophet, right? So I think prophets need to learn the balance between when you really need to function and what he's called you to be and not allow your talent to take residence over who you are. That's good. Um, and so I don't necessarily do that. There are times where, you know, I won't preach. And, you know, I'll be like, well, you know, I don't study my message, but the Lord be like, don't preach, don't preach. Now, I said this like four years ago, and I'm going to say it again. The, when we leave the, the, the uh, when, we, when we accept the fact that prophecy is more than just what you know, and begin to couple with the teaching grace to really teach people what prophecy is, then I think the accepts the acceptance of what prophecy really is will be able, we'll see the next dimension of that unfold. Because a lot of people in our generation, we uh we really have boxed the prophetic in well, well from what I see, let me not say everybody, but from what I see to just the word of knowledge around, you know, a money house and a car. There's no Issachar and there's no Shamar because for the black church, a lot of that stuff becomes become mystical, but really it's not mystical, it's a part of our makeup. And it's what we really need in this hour. We need prophets that know the times and we need prophets that are able to see further than where we are now to warn us and to put as a preparing factor of what's to come. But a lot of times we conception, because the prophet does carry wealth, the prophet does carry increase, we box them into that, or oh, I need you to come to my church and preach and you know raise a lot of money because the prophetic does carry wealth, you know, or I need you to come, you know, call a few names, even though that's just a faith building tactic. And really, in my mind you know your name and so if god uses me to call your name there's either a lack of faith there or there's somebody else in the room that needs faith if we are believers but hey that's just my personal belief but i believe a lot of times we glorify those things and the, even the word of wisdom and we really don't get into what the fourth telling or the foretelling and um i believe that the the um, emergence of the foretell the foretelling and the foretelling is getting ready to ha is really happening that people are going to know okay the the hunger of people because the Lord told me this that the dimension of hunger and people for that foretelling and foretelling is getting ready to heighten and you're going to need prophets that have that uh that that I am the spirit that can see beyond now. That's and, good. and so that's why I believe that God is raising. That's why when I talk about, you know, invading these different mountains, I don't believe the prophet should be religious, but we should be yoked to Jesus and being yoked to because religion means to be yoked to something. So be, we have to be yoked to Jesus to keep that dimension as we begin to invade and dominate when i mean by dominate which means we are supposed to be the voice we're all supposed to be the ones that say what tell the president what to do or tell this what to do or tell this person what to do we are supposed to want to be the ones that are able to figure out medicine and technology but if the but it, that's why i say it has to be coupled with the teaching grace because for the church uh it, a lot of it may when we they try to call things mysticism or really it's not mysticism it's really what we're it's really the totality of what we're called to do yeah but then so it makes them uncomfortable it does what service is like if i pre if i just get up and i say i see seven years from now the two buildings gonna fall and um and uh i see seven years yes like by the grace of god i prophesied monkey pops is recorded um two years like two years before it happened when COVID first broke out the lord showed me something eating the skin and i got on live and said it instantly you know the church thing oh we rebuke the devil oh you know they just going and rebuking the devil when really thing really some of these things is inevitable it's in the plan so it's going to happen god uses the prophet to foresee this to help you prepare 
for what's to happen. When I said in January, I, I, was, I was on Clubhouse. The Lord gave me word. He said, you need to, we need to start putting monies in different um in safes and different things. And I spoke, I said, Bank of America is going to have a glitch and it's going to be shut down. That happened in January. I got to record. I don't have to post these because I'm not that type of person. No. That happened. And, you know, I have people who can verify that I said it and it happened. But instantly people start rebuking the devil. And I'm saying like certain things are not, we so, you know, rebuking the devil. What you got to realize that certain things, the prophecy must be fulfilled. And so, excuse me, bless, bless. that devil don't want me to talk, you know, <laughs> but that is a part of the prophetic gift. So I believe a heightening of that ministry of the foretelling and the, um, the futuristic, I believe prophets should be more strategists in this hour. That's just my personal opinion, because I'm a prophet that the Lord has blessed to be on several businesses as what they call me an executive strategist. I know I'm a prophet, but when they come to me, they say, this is what it is. Should we do this? Should we do this? What do you see? They're not asking me to tell them their grandmama name and stuff. They want to know if I make this investment into this, is it going to turn in my favor? If I buy this land, am I going to get the fruit from it? What do you see? And I believe that God is bringing many prophets who can lead the realm of, oh, I just got to preach and I got to hoop and I got to be in a flat. But yeah, do that, but also be able to serve your present age and be able to uh, speak a word and be a strategist. Yeah, I think um, you said something. So I do this prophetic disclaimer. I say, and this is my prophetic disclaimer. Just because you never heard it before doesn't mean it isn't true. Right. Everything God says is not confirmation. Sometimes it's revelation. And right. what happens is when we move into the realms of the prophetic, where we actually get to revelation, um, that means it, revelation can't be confirmed. It has to be revealed. And so um, is, and what happens is when you get to that realm of the prophetic, you actually move into the mind of God, the mind of God, ready the bible says that god sits above heaven so the, what happens is we just stay we take our spirits to heaven and we stay there and we never enter into the mind of god the mind of god is even above the heavens and so there's a level of revelation that a prophet has access to that the heavens nor the earth had privy to that information yet and the mind of god um there's uh, four realms that the mind of God actually creates is the realm of emanation. This is a realm of, of the beginning of all creation. You go from the realm of emanation to the realm of creation where, or I'm sorry, realm of emanation to the realm of, it's really a realm of potentiality. Um, and that's where um, a lot of people prophesy from there too, because things change there. And so it could be one way, then it can kind of change another way. Um, that's why I tell people with prophecy, um, you know, and there's a space in prophecy where they could change as Hezekiah, um, you know, the prophet came, gave the accurate word of God, but it was in the realm of potentiality. Um, but the realm of emanation actually is the realm where things are created, uh, where are initiated. Then it goes to the realm of, uh, formation, which is when things are formed, where the ideals of it are actually formed, where, um, you can see how it's going to fit into an existing realm. And then it goes into the realm of reality. And what happens is we have trained people through religion, through church, and, and here's the truth, it was given to protect people from charlatans, but what it actually did was it, it locked us out of the prophetic. And wow. so when you, when you talk about those things, and so like this year, we did a prophetic forecast, not no us preaching, amen, not just a preaching a little message to say this is going to be for the year, but in this year, we actually have every month what was going to happen, the type of technologies and the type of investments we're supposed to make, we actually, and I have that on our website, but we have all those things that are actually supposed to release, and here goes the other thing, with social media, and with, because we become gospel stars and, and prophetic stars, um, I think sometimes people, you know, want to be the first person to prophesy a thing, you know, they want to have that acknowledgement, you know, it's good for social media, it's good for our bookings, um, all those kind of things. I think that it takes us away from the true prophetic, 
And ready? And here goes the other thing. Do you you gotta spend time in the realms of the spirit to get that kind of information? Oh, you that stuff don't just come overnight. You gotta sit there, you gotta spend time. It, you gotta it, spend time in yes. prayer. you gotta spend time speaking in tongues. Yes, you gotta spend time by yourself. Yes. You always be like Dion, you know, you just this, you that. I say I'm all of that what you say, baby. I'm trying to get some. Oh my God. Oh, I'm trying to be, you know, and I have my fun. Trust me, I have my fun. But most times during the week, I'm very much secluded because it's not, it's it's just like he she draws me away. Mm-hmm. And I just not, I just don't be interested. Mm-hmm. And then and in those times, it's download. Like I can preach, I ain't to my own home, but I can preach with the best of them. And he, but I will say that I enjoy preaching because Dion enjoys preaching. Mm-hmm. But ne- if I don't preach from the day of tomorrow, I know for a fact that he has called me to be a prophet. Amen. And that development over about 19, 20 years has shifted so much because the more I yielded myself to that call, the more he reveals to me. I was, cause sometimes, you can be limited based off your exposure. And so I was exposed to one thing. And even though I do not disrespect that, even though, thank God for the late Dr. Stacks, she was very much more spiritual than a lot of people knew. They actually listened to what she said. She had a great revelation on the spirit world. Um, But as me being exposed to different ministries, different cultures, different things, it opened, it began to bloom that prophetic flower in me. And now I can, I can just about, you know, dwell in any realm. But for the church whole as a whole, we got to, for those of you who are listening to us out there, (laughs) we got to open our minds and we got to unbox the prophet. Amen. Unbox. I'm gonna get a shirt. Unbox. I'm gonna do it. Yes, God. Unbox. Amen. I'm gonna do that. That's that's hot. Yeah. Let's do that. Unbox the prophet, and we need to. Okay, so we're gonna. I want to end like this. So since you've mentioned a couple times, about four times, how well of a preacher you are. So preach about me for um one minute. As we go to our close, uh, oh hold on, but wait, you need to come to LA to our prophetic conclave. Am I being invited? October the 11th through the 14th. I made it to the big leagues. The con- <laughs> <laughs> I made it. You know, one of my spiritual daughters say, uh, um, she says that the uh, conclave is the, our prophetic conclave is the uh, Met Gala of the prophetic, and so um, I want. You <laughs> but you really should come. It's October 11th to the 14th. Um, I, I should. I, you know what? Hmm. I'm. A, I'm. A, I'm gonna shoot you a text message after this. Um, but you should really come work your way to the West and come meet us. Y'all, time. if I end up on a flyer, <laughs> listen, I done made it. And when I tell you I done made it, and when I tell you I'm a I'm gonna show out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so okay, and I leave it. Just preach real quick a little something for like a minute and a half while we close. What? <laughs> Come on, you can do it. <laughs> Come on. Off for this podcast. No. <laughs> Woo! God's gonna do it for you. Touch, just touch every neighbor in your house. It's turning around for you. Right now. Hey, Glover. My God. My God. <laughs> now, I really honor you. I really thank you for thinking of me. I am so excited. Oh, Most yeah, for sure. I know that um, I want to say this, and this is just, you know, exclusive for you. Most of you probably know I, me from Let the Millennial Prophet Speak. Last year, I uh, disintegrated that. Um, that part of chapter of my life. Uh, I did that for four years and that was great. But coming very, very soon is MAP. And MAP 
is going to be very, uh, very, very innovative. And definitely y'all to have more, um, more information about it. But I'm sharing here first. Maps is coming. Millennial Apostles and Prophets Conclave. You better look for it. It's going to be dope. All right. That's good. But listen, but I, I know the chancellor um, better be invited. Um, I invited you to the last time and you know the chance you always busy. That's why I, know I was busy I though, but just you gotta tell me early. I it to LA, it's gonna be, it's gonna be. I really know <laughs> God did it for me. And I'm gonna testify. <laughs> All right, that's amazing. Well, y'all heard it here first. Um, thank you, nephew. I love you so much. Um, you, you know, too. I'm always a call, a text message away. Um Absolutely. All right, this is our show. Thank y'all so much for listening and watching. All right, bye. Boom.